Judge Floyd. Good morning. Uh, truly an honor to be here in uh, Orlando today. Uh, I, I have some, a very good friend in the audience. I want to I wanna say a special hi to Denise Dancy from the National Center for State Courts. Um, the, I want, first wanted to say uh, a special thanks to the uh, National Center for State Courts for the invitation to speak here at this conference. The, um, <clears throat> as introduced, my, uh, my uh, topic today is justice systems in Indian country and how do you, how do you talk about justice systems in Indian country? I'll give it my best. <laughs> The uh, justice systems, uh, as I told you, my name, uh, again, Richard Blake, I'm the uh, Chief Judge of the Hoopa Valley Tribal Court, as well as a tr member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe. Um, the, I am also the contractual judge for the Smith River Rancheria and Redding Rancheria Tribal Courts, also located in Northern California. Those, uh, the, I, I want to give you a little bit of history on the, on the court systems that I work with. Um, because the justice systems that were developed in, in my region were, were developed more out of tradition and custom more so than law. When I say customs and tradition, my, my court actually was developed in 1974, the Hoopa Valley Tribal Court. In 1974, I was, I was trying to think, I think I was in the first or second grade, so you know that court system's actually been around for quite some time. And uh, they, um, that system um, was developed because of our, our fishing. We have a huge, huge um, fishing uh, culture that, um, that has passed down generation to generation. And as a result of the fishing, um, we found a need to have a court system for the violations of uh, fishing, um, fishing uh, rights in our, in our reservation. So the Hoopa Valley Tribal Court was initially um, developed as a fishing court. It wasn't actually a, it wasn't a court that heard anything other than fishing violations. And that could be anything from somebody that was illegally fishing on our reservation to, um, to netting, to doing all, all kinds of things they weren't supposed to be doing with these fish. So that's, the, that's how the Hoopa Valley Tribal Court um, was, initially, uh, was initially started. From, um, from that point forward, the court system was developed as we needed it. We later found out with the Indian child welfare issues that we needed to develop in that area. We later found out that we needed housing ordinances. We later found out that we needed, uh, it, 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 as recent, goes up into dog ordinances and things that, um, such as that. Uh, as earlier stated, the National Center for State Courts had, uh, Denise had called me and she said, Richard, I need you to do me a favor. <laughs> Can you, uh, can, you do, can you do a presentation for us in Orlando? I was like, sure, I'd be happy to. Whenever Denise calls and she needs some help with something, I'm there to help her out. So, <laughs> and likewise, the uh, relationship that the, uh, that the, um, the um, tribes have with the National Center for States Courts has developed over the past several years, and I'm very, very proud to be a participant in that, uh, in that, uh, in that um, relationship. Um, as um, also presented, I am also the first vice president of the National American Indian Court Judges Association. Uh, the acronym is NIJA. NIJA is an organization that was developed in 1972 or 70, I believe, 1970. Boy, it's terrible. But uh, 1970, it's an organization of tribal court judges, current and retired tribal court judges, and or um, peacekeepers. Uh, so you don't have to actually be a judge, you can be a peacekeeper to be a part of our organization. The organization uh, is recently relocated to the uh, Boulder, Colorado area. Uh, we were in um, Albuquerque, but relocated back to Boulder. And our current president, Jill Tompkins, um, gave her blessing for me to, to be here today. And she also sends her apologies that she was not able to make this, uh, to make this conference, but uh, Jill recently accepted a new job. She left the University of Colorado Boulder to, to take, a, uh, organiza uh, take a job with the Casey Foundation. So she is, um, she is going to uh, venture into a new job title and uh, didn't, have the, uh, didn't have the ability to make the trip uh, here to Orlando. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I got that job and um, I am very, very happy to be here. 
The, um, I'm also um, wanted to inform you that the organization has a yearly conference ourselves, and this year that organ uh, our organization is having its, um, its annual conference in Prior Lake, Minnesota at the Mystic Lake Casino in, uh, right outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul. <coughs> The, um, my, one of my other duties, and uh, I know that Alan was here um, from the state of California, is the, um, the California Tribal State Forum. And I, I want to give that a plug also because when you're talking about relationships between the uh, tribes and, and the states, uh, the tribal courts and the state courts, uh, this was a big, this is a big uh, task that we undertook and one that, uh, that I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about. The Tribal State Forum um, in 2007, then Chief Justice, uh, California Chief Justice Ronald George um, had um, sent me a letter and he asked me, would you like to be on our Blue Ribbon Commission? This is um, a commission to deal with children, with, uh, children in foster care. I was the only, I was the only native judge uh, appointed to the commission and I, and I thought, well, a little bit of time, but sure, it's an issue. We have plenty of children in, in foster care, so I thought that it was something that I, that I wanted to be involved in. That gave me the opportunity to have access to the California Administrative Office of the Courts. Uh, I loved it because, one, I had a direct line of communication to the Chief, Chief Justice. Uh, Chief Justice uh, Ronald George, uh, at, his, at our first uh, meeting, asked me, about tribal courts and how those tribal courts operated. I thought, here's the top dog in the state of California in the judicial system, and he does not know how our, how our court systems operate, so I'm going to give him a little bit of education on how that happens. Well, um, as, it, as it goes, um, I, um, I didn't get to see the Chief Justice as much as I'd like to, but I had access to his staff. And I, I told them, I said, gee, I'd like to be able to have a sit down and talk with the chief about how tribal courts operate. And uh, since there are so many developing tribal courts in the state of California, let's, uh, let's see if we can get together and, and meet. Well, that's easier said than done. If anybody uh, has any, any dealings with chief justices in the state, say uh, they're very busy people and uh, getting an appointment with them is like next to, next to impossible. It was suggested what I do is that I write a letter to the Chief Justice and ask for this meeting. And they said, you know, you can try it and see what happens. And, you know, I'm sure he gets plenty of offers every day for people to write letters and ask for, you know, for an appointment. I did. On behalf of the, at that time, 11 tribal courts in the state of California, I wrote a letter to the Chief Justice and I said, uh, uh, dear so-and-so, I would like to meet with you. And, you know, it's pretty pretty brief, and um, we'll see where this goes. Um, we didn't hear anything for, this was in June, we didn't hear anything at all. July, August, September, October. The middle of October comes around and we get a response. We get a response from the Chief Justice that says, yes, let's do it, let's have a meeting. My, uh, my idea behind the meeting with the Chief Justice was to talk about the issues of jurisdiction how our court systems could intermingle, how our court systems could assist one another. And what I, my vision at that point was, uh, if any of you are well aware of the uh, Teague Protocol that has that, uh, been developed in the state of Wisconsin, the Teague Protocol um, it is a agreement between the state court systems and the tribal court systems in Wisconsin. And um, after hearing about this, I thought, if it can happen in Wisconsin, why can't it happen in California? Such, an, you know, such a progressive state. Let's see what we can do. So I, every time I'd see the Chief Justice, he'd call me Teague Blake. I said, uh, you know, that was a, it, was a good, uh, it was a good nickname because one of the, that's one of the things that I was working for was to develop this working relationship with the state of California with, between tribal courts and the um, and the. Uh, um, state. The, the, um, on December 23rd, 2009, we got that meeting. We not only got the meeting, but the state of California paid for that meeting. They, they flew 
each of the tribal court judges from the, and then, like I said, 11 court, uh, tribal courts around the state of California, they, they flew us to San Francisco, they paid for our lodging, they, they did all this. That was a commitment that the Chief Justice had in maintaining or building this relationship with tribal courts. The tribal courts that, um, that were presented at that point had, um, we had several uh, different varieties of tribal courts that were being represented. My court in Hoopa is more of the Western style court um, than what you, what you see in probably the state court systems that, or the county systems that you come from. My, uh, my court um, sits in a very remote area. So when I did my presentation to the Chief Justice on what my court system looked like, it was pretty much what, uh, what they would see on a, smaller, on a smaller level. But some of the tribal courts that the other, that the other uh, chief judges would, would, be, um, would be presenting on would be uh, courts that are, uh, that are held less than once a month maybe once bi-monthly, once every you know, quarter. Um, so the, the court systems looked routinely different. None of the, none of the uh, 11 courts that were presented looked similar. We, none of us looked alike. So that was, a, that was kind of a unique, um, a unique thing. The, um, the Chief Justice supported the development of the California tribal state forum. The, um, the forum um, at that point uh, had, had representatives from the administrative offices of courts. We were assigned an attorney, a, a supervising attorney uh, that, um, that is leading that forum. And I, I, even though she's not here, I do want to say her name is Jennifer Walter at the California AOC. And Jennifer is a good contact person for anybody that's in, interested in developing a tribal state forum. Um, and um, she, uh, she would welcome any type of uh, contact from anyone that is interested in doing something like that. Chief Justice George decided for some reason that he, um, that he wanted to retire. I don't know what he was thinking of. He'd been there a million years, and, and so a new Chief Justice was appointed. And I'm going to slaughter her name, and she, you know, I have to, uh, her Chief Justice Cantil Sukawe. As, uh, as the current Chief Justice. When the Chief Justice was appointed, um, she had a, uh, um, a meeting with the, uh, with the forum. I was concerned because one of the, with the budget cuts in the state of California and, and across the nation, I just knew that what she was going to tell us was that uh, they were unable to continue to support the forum. To the contrary, the Chief Justice told us not only did she continue to support the forum, that she that is something that she felt was important, and in a in a um, a um, forum that she would give her 100% support to continuing, and um, as a result, we um, we have um, continued that forum with her blessing. And um, I have gone through several co-chairs uh, co the, at the forum, which are typically um, uh, superior court justices that, um, that sit as my co-chair. So I, uh, I work with some uh, pretty, uh, pretty impressive people for a small town boy. The uh, issues in California that, um, that, uh, be, that we brought to the table, the tribal courts um, have, have um, issues that are unique. When I, when I say unique, uh, I, I kind of explained a few of those that part of the, part of the issues with um, tribal courts are with state court judges, um, you don't see them as active in their community as I am. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things is that um, people always call me and they say, hey judge, we're, we're, doing, um, we're doing a fundraiser. Would you mind calling bingo for us? Well, you know, that's not very often you see a judge that decides that he has to go out there and call bingo. They, in a community where they said, hey judge, we don't have enough people coaching our t-ball teams, our, our youth soccer, could you, could you help out? I have no kids at age and I still, I'm still out there uh, doing, those, uh, doing those functions for, for my community. In California, we currently have 19 tribal courts. So in the past two years, there have been eight new tribal courts. Eight new tribal courts that, um, that we have, um, 
that have been developed or developing. In addition, there are five other courts that are being in a process, in a planning process. So in the state of California, we will have, uh, in the very, very near future, 24 uh, tribal court systems in the state of California. Um, to a, I mean, 25 tribal courts in a, in a community that, um, that has uh, the largest uh, population of, well, what a mug shot there. <laughs> the, um, again, I, just a little bit of the information that I, that I had uh, talked about. These are pictures that uh, I'm sure Denise recognizes. I mean, these are, um, this is at our conference in uh, Louisiana this year. The, um, we have that at Marksville, Louisiana, and we, um, because of the, the tribal state relationship, we had, um, uh, Chief, I mean, um, Justice Harry Hull from the, um, uh, from the uh, state of California that came to do a presentation on the tribal state forum. Um, the, my co-partners there, uh, as stated, is um, our president, our uh, past president, uh, Roman Duran in the center, and the second vice president, Kevin Briscoe from the state of Mississippi. Um, very, very good friends. I've been on the, uh, on the uh, Nigel board with those, um, with those individuals for the past seven years, I think. Uh, Judge Duran stepped down this year and uh, decided that uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, something that he was able to commit the time to doing. And Denise probably recognizes the arm sling because it seems like every year I had something else going on with my arm and I had to I had these uh, repeat, uh, repeat things, uh, surgeries going on with my arms. So Denise and I here would like to share our stories about uh, our, our disadvantages in uh, the medical, uh, medical realm. Tribes in the United States, I want to, I want to give you just a brief overview. The, the pictures here are from my reservation. Uh, those, are, um, those are traditional houses that we call hontas. Uh, and the, as, as you can see, these are located along the Trinity River. I'll just to give you a little bit of history, they're located, they're located right beside a river. The, um, the top one is an actual living house. The bottom one is a sweat, is a sweat house. So you could uh, sweat in a smaller house, run out, hop in a river, and do all that stuff. I have never done it. Never done it. One, the holes are about that big, and as you can see, I'm not, uh, I'm not one that's gonna get in and out of that hole very easily, so. And there's a reason that they have them like that, and I, I don't know what it is. So the 2010 census revealed that 5.2 million American Indians and Alaskan Natives reside in the United States. Compared to years ago, where there were, they estimated 70 million. So you see there's been a, a reduction in, in the, um, the amount of, uh, of native people in the, uh, in the uh, United States, but this only represents 1.7% of the total U.S. population. So again, when you're, when you're talking about uh, tribes in general, you're talking about a small percentage of, of people that, I mean, of a population. 334 reservations in the United States and 565 federally recognized tribes. Of the, um, of the parties here, how many of you have a reservation system in your area? Okay, good, good. And um, the, how many of them have a developed court, a tribal court? All right, it's good to see. So, the, um, so what, what, what I did was I, I put a, a map up here of the tribal court systems in the, state of, in the United States. So currently, there are about 150 tribal courts throughout the United States. So 150 tribal courts for a, for a land that big for, you know, 5.2 million people. Not a lot, but they're developing. But like I heard the speaker say this morning, you know, systems as, they, as, the, uh, as the funding gets um, more and more less frequent, or the funding opportunities go away, so do the court systems even in Indian country. We're, we're, just like every other court system, we're grossly underfunded, and there is definitely a need for tribal courts to, to exist in, the, um, in uh, the United States. Now where I am from, if you look at this, 
I am from, God, uh, right about there. So I flew ocean to ocean to, cut to, to come here. And let me tell you, it was a, it was a long trip. <laughs> it was a long trip because I, I, I went from um, there to there to there to there to there. I, I, didn't, there, I, I didn't know that there was planes that came directly to Orlando because, you know, th that just would be too, too unique. So, but as we, um, as we talk about these tribal court systems, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an, a brief overview of some of the tribal courts with the blessings of the tribal courts that I'm presenting on. These are, these are peers that I work with. I mean, peers that I, that I know through the, uh, the uh, NIDRA organization. And when I told them about the uh, presentation, Everyone wanted, to, everyone wanted to give their information. However, some sovereign nations are kind of, are, are, they're sharing their information is not as easy as I, it is in, in other organizations. It's not as public as everyone else's uh, uh, information is. And when they were giving information, some of it wasn't as um, user-friendly as I'd like it to be, so I didn't, I didn't use the, we had uh, 20, we had 20 tribal courts that submitted information to be presented here today, and I think, I, I think I'm doing seven of the courts. I think I have information on seven of the courts. And unfortunately, three of those are the court systems that I work on uh, in, in Hoopa. And so as, as you get east, you'll see on the, east, on the east coast, you have fewer and fewer reservations. The green areas are what, what are classified as Indian country with a big portion of them being in the, um, in the New Mexico, Arizona area, the Four Corners area, I think, is what they, is what they call that. But as you, as you get further east, you'll see that there are more and more uh, reservations in the state of California. And it gets even, when you get up into the Alaskas, um, you'll see that there are, the villages are even spread further apart. So the, the issues of tribal courts um, in those regions are going to be even more difficult to, to discuss. <clears throat> this, uh, this picture here is a picture of my reservation. When you talk about remote, we don't have a Walmart. <laughs> you know, we don't have nothing. I mean, the, the reservation, I, I moved uh, to the reservation after being elected judge in 2002. Um, my, my family has been there forever, and uh, my mom lives there. And um, it, is, um, it is a beautiful, beautiful place to live. But uh, again, the court was, my, my court in Hoopa was established in 1974, court of general jurisdiction, meaning that we'd hear just about everything with the exception of adult criminal cases. We do not hear adult criminal cases. I am elected every four years, so, and uh, I am working on my last term. I am not going to, re, I'm not going to run again. I am going to find... Uh, I, like I have two other two other courts I sit in that I'd be just as happy sitting there as uh, it's a uh, personal it's a personal um, choice I, I decided I'd like to do other things besides um, uh, sit there. The types of cases that we hear um, that you may see in a in the court systems that you are uh, associated with the civil the family law housing juvenile environmental employment traffic and elder abuse. The, the, when you see juvenile and elder abuse, those are primarily the, the big focus points for my court because those are the cases that we hear a lot of. And also the other type of cases that I hear tr tremendous amounts of cases are, are domestic violence cases. One that uh, my, my dear friend Denise and I, uh, that I, I affectionately term as my sister from the other, uh, from the other side of the country. But those are the cases that we, um, that we hear the most of. So those are the cases that, you know, that when you're talking about the uh, types of cases that a tribal court may hear are those. Our operating costs, you know, a staggering $380,000. You know, if, when, you look at, when you look in the state court systems, that's just a drop in a bucket. That's probably, a, you know, a day's operation cost for some of the state court systems that you may come from. But for $380,000, we, uh, we all work um, pretty much. The, is, you see the number of cases filed? Uh, in 2010, we have um, 369 plus ongoing cases, meaning cases that have been, been ongoing since, uh, since 1999 and on. So those cases continue to stagger, and we, we review those every six months. So 
the total number of cases, if you were to, um, to add them together, would be probably over 700 in 2010. 2011, we had 441 plus the ongoing cases, and, and we, you add on to those, you know, some of those go away, some of them continue on. But um, my court administrator before I left told me that our, our number of cases that we were going to, we're hearing this year, 882 cases um, for this year. And it's like, hey, that's double the 441. She goes, right, so 882. The uh, mugshot up there, my, my, court, uh, my court really liked that. That was at re-election. Um, and the ironic part about, talk about, I, I always say, behind every successful judge is, a, is court staff that makes you look good. And th those are the people right there that, uh, that make me what I am, I believe. The, uh, and unfortunately, uh, in Indian country, the lady there in the, on my right is my cousin Supaha. She's my senior court clerk. The lady on my left, in the, between me and the lady on the end, is my cousin Faleen. She is my court administrator. The lady on the end, we affectionately tell her that she's a tribal member by proxy because uh, she's been with us. My uh, associate judge and law clerk, uh, Michelle Krieger. And um, Michelle has, uh, the, int the interesting thing is, as I inform my court staff, that uh, this is my last term, I'm not going to uh, run. So we are currently recruiting, um, we're currently recruiting a court administrator, a court clerk, and a law clerk. So, um, because when I leave, they're all leaving too. So I said that there's some dedication when, with, uh, when they will stand behind you to the point that, uh, that they will also leave. The Hoopa Valley Tribal Court, uh, again, our court, I had a picture of it and uh, it was so bad I couldn't, I couldn't put it up there. It was just my, uh, my photography skills are very, very poor, so I didn't, uh, I didn't put it up there. The Smith River Rancheria Tribal Court, um, I have been with that since its inception in 2006. The, um, up on the, when you talk about court systems, um, this is a very, very small court. Um, when I say small, um, we only have court one day a month, or sometimes twice a month. The Smith River Rancheria tr Tribal Court, um, they, uh, the tribal council is very involved and it was very involved in the development of this court. When I say involved, they sat down at the table with us, they asked us what you need, how are you gonna do it? I actually shared a courtroom, if you will, with the tribal council because they didn't have the, the uh, they didn't have the building for the tribal court, so they let us use the, um, the tribal council chambers. They have since built a uh, court in 2010, and that's a picture of the courtroom up there on the top left. Again, I'm sitting as a, um, as a contractual judge for the Smith River Rancheria since its inception in 2006, and I have a court administrator, Nita Rhodes, who was going to come as, as um, a guest speaker and, and co-present with me, but uh, because of budget issues, she was unable to do so. And we also have a, a, uh, a backup court clerk, Devin O'Reilly. The type of cases that we hear there, typically just family matters. Uh, unlawful detainers, uh, ICWA matters, civil matters, juvenile court, um, is pending. Uh, when I say pending, we, they passed the, the tribal council there, passed the juvenile ordinance last week. So starting the, in the month of August, we will start hearing juvenile citations. And when I, when I talk about juvenile citations, what we are doing is we are taking jurisdiction of uh, our tribal member children that are in a state court system. We are taking those children and working with them on, um, on, on lower level uh, uh, criminal offenses. The operating uh, budget for that court system, 93000 a majority of that, um, that $93,000 is paid to the uh, court administrator and to the court clerk, and a, a small, very small portion of that is um, paid out in, uh, in my salary. The unique thing about Smith River is the geographic location, and um, this, this reservation, you see they, have a, they also have a river that uh, if um, at the deepest part of that river you can stand on the top of a rock and look and see, the, see clear to the bottom of it. It's one of the most 
pristine rivers in Northern California. It's still a wild river, no dam on it. So it is, uh, it is truly a, um, a, um, a miracle. The um, Smith River Rancheria Tribal Court is located right on the very northern tip of the state of California. And their aboriginal um, territory is in the state of California and the state of Oregon. So when we deal with uh, when we deal with state court systems in in that court, you have to deal with Oregon and you have to deal with California. So and you have to deal with Del Norte County and Curry County. So we we, we deal with a bigger a bigger um, uh, peer group in that uh, court system than we do in uh, in Hoopa or in um, in my my next court that I'll talk about that I didn't do a slide for because. I, uh, again, I'm telling you, my photography is, is pretty bad. Um, the the next, yes, sir. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And uh, jury trials. I, I since I've been there, I've been uh, chief judge for two. I mean, for two years since 2002, and I've actually held two. Did they ever proceed? No. We seated a jury, and once they saw who was sitting on a jury, the, the tribal member says, uh, no, nah, I, 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 I don't think I'll get a fair shake. But um, typically, um, you, you know, a jury of their peers uh, sometimes can be harder on them than, you know, having a bench trial. So they usually opt for a bench trial. <clears throat> I was going to talk briefly about my court in Redding, and I'll tell you, Redding, uh, Redding, California, is the largest city in Northern California, south of Sacramento. I mean, north of Sacramento. I'm sorry. And um, Redding is, uh, I think, there there are towns boasting in that community about 260,000 people. So, pretty big city, and a pretty their their court system is also like Smith River. They have court there once every three weeks. So. It doesn't take a lot of my a lot of my time, but one of the things I want to say is that even though I'm here in Orlando, my court systems in California. If if one of them was to call me and say, you know what, I need a I need an EPO right now. I need a protection order. They scan the stuff into me. They email it to me. Whatever, however they're going to get it to me, and uh, look at it up on my smartphone, and um, I draft that order and I send it out. So you know, you're not, you, when you when you got a one-stop shop court, that's what you have in Indian country. Because no matter where you go, your staff is still going to call you and tell you. Unlike the state court judges, where you have two judges to back you up, or 10, 15 judges to back you up in Indian country, it's just me a, a majority of the time. The intertribal court system of California, Southern California, gosh, what a what a what a system. Um, Judge Brandenburg. Um, the gentleman listed here, Judge Brandenburg, uh, is a very, very awesome guy. Judge Brandenburg is a retired uh, San Diego County commissioner, um, uh, which, is a, uh, which is a judge for all intent and purposes. He is the chief judge of the intertribal court uh, system of Southern California. They're located in Valley Center, California, which for those of you that uh, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, San Diego area. His court administrator, is his name is Tamet Aguilar. I don't know where Jamet came from. And again, I guess my typing skills are as bad as my photography. But um, their court staff is considerably different than what you see in Northern California. The court staff uh, includes one associate judge, five pro tem judges, and three full-time support staff. The types of cases they may hear, tort claims, family law, civil, ICWA, elder abuse cases. They also hear the, they also hear the, um, the domestic violence type uh, cases that everybody else has. The unique thing about, uh, about this court system is you can see by the, the different uh, tribal seals that have been listed there, they, they're a consortium of, of tribes. So because their, their uh, reservations are so small and so scattered in the Southern California region, they decided what they were going to do is they were going to pool their money and they were going to develop a court system that, um, that uh, was able to, they were able to, um, to hold court in each one of those uh, court in each one of those tribal uh, arenas that they they see ne uh, needed. 
So what they would do, what they do at this point is, is say that um, the uh, Saboba tribe needs to have a case heard. They call Judge Brandenburg, and they tell Judge Brandenburg or, his, or Tumet or uh, his uh, support staff and tell them that we have a case that we need to have heard in. in uh, so they, they, they have their process for getting those on calendar. And Judge Brandenburg tells me that he had to learn each one of those tribal codes. That would be like having one, uh, one judge sitting for Wisconsin, Minnesota, Utah, so you know each one of those each one of those tribes has their own sovereign um, laws, meaning that each one of those tribes is um, has developed a a law that uh, fits the needs of their of their organization individually. So, as Judge Brandenburg, where I have I have three that I had to learn, he's got all of these. They boast seventeen different organizations in their in their co in their. Uh, collaborative uh, in Southern California. I've listed the ones, uh, the member tribes of the organization. There are actually more, um, but not all of them use this for a for those type of cases. There's one tribe that uses them for housing disputes only, for you know, for a housing um, appeals process only. So th that's the only process because the other the other. Um, the other types of cases are actually heard by their tribal council. They, don't, they didn't want uh, anybody to take that away from them, so their tribal council, because that is the way that their, that the way that their um, laws and ordinances went, that the tribal council is still their, is still their um, not only their court, but their appellate court. So if the tribal council didn't like what they did the first time, they just turned around and said, we're going to do it a second time. So, yes, ma'am. We are a public law 280 state in California, but we'll get to we'll get to another state that yeah, yeah so but in California, criminal cases uh, are heard um, by the state court system. The um, as a, in this system, when when um, you talk about working with more more tribes, the operating cost for this one is six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And Judge Brandenburg told me that was a low estimate. He said. Quite honestly, he goes, I, I was going to bare bones, meaning that's what I, the minimum I think is costing us. When I asked him to give me a, 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 what he figured it could be the top end, he estimated $1.4 million to operate that court system, which is considerably double what, uh, what they estimated on the lower end. But Judge Brandenburg, they, because he comes from an area in Southern California where they have big casinos, the casinos, uh, of course, generate more um, contract torts type of cases that uh, require, you know, require more uh, court hearings. Judge Brandenburg, um, as a result, cannot hear all those for all those cases. As a result, had to bring in the additional judges and the additional pro tems, and um, the um, as a result, um, they are continuing as the tribes are developing there and the casinos are developing. They are finding that they have more and more need to uh, add new members into their uh, into their collaborative and into their um, court system, and he expects that at, um, within the next three to five years that that could actually support a what you would see in uh, a a smaller county system where they they could actually have um, what he figured ten full time judges, which is uh, it's a lot of work. Um, he, uh, he also asked if I was interested in coming there and working with them once I, and I said, no. <laughs> so we leave, we leave the state of California, and we're going to go to the state of Alaska. The Kanitsai Indian Tribal Court is, um, when, I, um, when we talk about the state of Alaska, the state of Alaska has so many unique, unique things about it that... Um, not only is it uh, big, but as you look at the you look at the map of, uh, of of Alaska, and you're talking about the United States and uh, the lower 48 and Indian Country, you look at how scattered the Indian Country is in the uh, the Alaska um, state of Alaska. The little yellow dots represent the villages in Alaska. The um, this tribal court that I'm talking about is located on a peninsula 
by the red dot, the big, big red dot that is. The, um, the chief judge there, Kimberly Frankie, is a, also a board member for the, um, for the NIGEL organization. And when I asked her about uh, giving information on her court, she said, oh my, how do, how, how do I tell you about this without, without sounding like we are, we are so um, unorganized? She goes, in that court system, she has three support staff. I was like, wow, three, that's just like what I have. And she said, well, no, that's not full-time support staff. That's when needed. So whenever they need support staff, um, they, um, that's when the people, um, they, they um, step up to the plate. When I say step up to the plate, it's because if you look down, their funding, um, the uh, CTAS grant, the wages are supplemented by a third party, by third party funds. So their, their wages aren't even guaranteed unless somebody is going to step forward and take money out of their pocket and say, here, you know, this is for the tribal court staff when they, when they work. There, so that way, she was unable to tell me what her operating costs were. She didn't know. She said, I, I, I couldn't honestly tell you. She goes, one year, you know, it could be $40,000. Uh, another year, it could be $80,000. When I, when I asked her about the types of cases that they hear, the child in need of care and custody was their, their number one type of cases that they hear. Because of their, in Alaska and in, in Alaska, in the villages, alcoholism and drug addiction is severely high, and as a result, the child in need of care and the custody issues are extremely high. So that's the majority of the type of cases. Along with that comes the, um, the domestic the protection orders. Those are very, very high in the state of Alaska. Um, divorce, adoption, juvenile justice, they all kind of go along with that family law type of uh, court system and one that they, um, that they tell us that they have, um, that they hear majority of theirs. 50 to 60 cases a year, my gosh, I'd love that. I would love to hear 50 or 60 cases a year, but you know, when, you're, um, when you don't know when you're gonna work or where your money's coming from, it would be uh, pretty difficult to, uh, to gauge a living on that. So in 2009, I tried to look for something a little bit more frequent, and Kim was trying to help me with that, but um, the Native Alaska Native population was estimated at 54,665. Denise, is, is that about right, do you think? Yeah, it's about right. Okay. So, um, you know, 16% of that population is urban, 84% rural. So, you know, 84% of those, <laughs> those natives are living out there in the middle of all that, uh, all that. Alaska natives, uh, Alaska natives and uh, American Indian Alaska natives uh, represent 6.6% of, of the population in Alaska. And of, that, um, of those reporting, two, uh, t a majority of that population had two or more races, uh, two or more races that they reported in the census. So I asked, I asked Kim, I said, tell me about your relationship with the, uh, with the state court system. Kim told me the, the unique thing about uh, Alaska is she goes, guess what, it snows up here. It's pretty, it's pretty darn cold, she said, in the, in the wintertime. So she said, um, when, they, when they have a case that they, when she goes, you hear about people going places by snowmobile, they actually do. She goes, so as a result, sometimes people can't make it to court. They can't make it even, you know, two miles to make it to a court, you know, to a court system in the event that they need it. So they, they're trying to find a way that they can, their court system can, you know, can operate in adverse weather conditions. What, they're, what I'm doing is next month I'm headed to Alaska to be doing presentations on um, telephonic court hearings and, and how, those can, how those can occur in, in these communities. We are in the process of doing uh, right now um, court hearings where the court sits, I mean, the judge sits in one location and the uh, defendant and, and plaintiff may sit in a whole different area. And the, um, with the use of um, technology, that those parties are brought together and they're able to, uh, they're able to bring a case forward and orders of protection or, or the, um, child in need of care um, issues can be addressed uh, in those real remote regions of, uh, of, um, of uh, Alaska. 
I got a uh, real quick story to tell about the state of Alaska. I, uh, when I decided that I wanted to get into the uh, law area, I decided that I was going to apply for a scholarship. And I was looking on the internet and I found a, I found a uh, scholarship uh, from a tribe out of Alaska. But uh, as a result of taking the, uh, the scholarship, you had to agree to do their two years um, service after completion of, of school. So I said, well, yeah, I, I, I can do that. You know, they'll pay you. And well, who wants to, I mean, come on, Alaska, moose, you know, you can see Northern Lights, you can see all these things. So I, uh, I applied and the deadline came up and they called me and said, geez, we're sorry, we only had three people apply. We really like to have a minimum of five. So all right, so I waited. And um, three months later, they called me and said, okay, we have our five. We have our five, and we're going to, um, we're going to interview for this, for this scholarship. Full ride scholarship, it's like, I'll, I'll, okay. So they, uh, they called me, and they said, well, this, um, we'd like you to come to Point Barrow, Alaska. We're going to pay for your way to Point Barrow, Alaska. We'd like to interview you, and I said, sure. Well, one of the parties was pregnant and uh, was unable to make the trip. And so they, I mean, was unable to make the uh, trip up to uh, Point Barrow, so they canceled the, uh, they canceled this interview. And uh, so they called me again, and they said, well, we've changed our mind. What we're going to do is we're going to fly our interview panel to Seattle. We'd like to meet you in Seattle. Is that right? So I get to, this, I fly to Seattle, and... Um, about as far north as I think I've been so far. And um, I, I, the hotel that we were staying at was right across from SeaTac Airport. And, we, and so I get there and I flew up for the day because I, I just thought, well, there's no need to stay. I'm just going to interview and I'm going to leave. I took a carry-on, a, a, uh, <laughs> a suit bag with me, and I get to the interview and, uh, and I go... I rent a room for the day, and I go in there and realize that I didn't take any dress shoes. I had, took a, had taken a suit and took tennis shoes and wore on a plane, so I had to interview in these tennis shoes. I walk into this room. They, they held the interview in this room that was a hotel room, and they had a, they, the people sat on a bed. <laughs> and uh, they, I, I walked in there. There was three ladies and two gentlemen that uh, were interviewing five people one of them being a tribal elder who spoke no English. First time she'd ever been, she's 83 years old, first time she'd ever been away from Alaska, first time she'd ever been on an airplane, first time she'd ever been in the city of Seattle. So a real cultural, real, real cultural uh, shock for her. I walk, into the, I walk into the room and I'm standing there and the first thing I notice is that she just keeps looking at my tennis shoes that I have on with the suit and I was like, this is, a, this, is not a, this is not going to be a good thing. So um, as I'm, they're all seated on this bed, and as I'm standing there, they have this little, this little table thing sit there, and on this table, they have three items. And when you talk about you know, uh, unique tribal custom, th these three items, they told me, go ahead, approach that table, and take those items. I walked up and I looked at them. One of them was a carving. It was a, a carving of a seal. The second one was a, um, it, it appeared to be a candle. The third was a package of what at that time I believed was wax. So I, I, I looked at the items and they asked me, um, tell us, well, no, they, they, so they, they continued with their, they said just, okay, you've seen them, just leave them. So they asked me to continue, and we talked, and they asked me about my family, and they were really big about my family, you know, my, my cultural upbringing, uh, did I know my language, did I, did I know um, about uh, my people? And I, I, sh I, shared, I, I shared my culture, I sh I'm very, very proud of my culture, I shared my culture with them. And I, and, I, and I brought all this knowledge that I had with me to, to Seattle, Washington for this. And they asked me, what was my goal? Why did I want to work in a justice system? And I told them, well, I, I want to create a justice system that I feel would benefit my people. I, I wanted to benefit my people. 
So we, we, they asked me to go ahead and approach a table again and to look at this, to look at this table and tell me what it was, because they say law school is all about logic. You know, that's what law school is about, is logic. And they want me to tell them what was on this table and the reason that they brought this stuff. I, I, again, I looked at it and I thought, I don't know. I, 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 had to, I had to think about it. They said, well, pick them up. So I picked them up. I'm looking at them. And I thought, only from Alaska could they bring things like this and, uh, and do, <laughs> do things like this to me. So long story short, what this was, it was a test of, uh, of, uh, of um, logic. What the, um, when, at the, as they, I got ready to leave, they said, well, we'd like you to tell us what this was, what the, what the items were that we brought and why we would why we share those with you. My, my, my answer, if you will, was one was a fetish. It was a carved, it was a, it was a fetish carved. Typically those are given for luck. Second, what the second item was a candle. The third, was whale blubber. If you've never seen it, it's the most, it was so stink that I, I just like, ugh. In my culture, you, if somebody offers you something, regardless if, if you like it or not, you have to eat it. It's one of those things your mom says, if they offer it, you eat it, you don't say a word about it, and believe me, I've eaten some pretty disgusting things that, uh, I, don't, <laughs> that I don't wanna. But um, I, I told them, what I told them was, uh, I believed that the fetish was for luck in my journey. The candle was to light my way on my journey. And whatever this last thing was, it's obviously to nourish me on my journey. And um, with that, I left. They told me that uh, we would not hear, uh, we wouldn't hear um, a result for this, um, for this scholarship for a month. They said, we're gonna, it's gonna take us a while to figure out that for five people, that's gonna be pretty, pretty in-depth uh, thinking. I left. Um, in my suit with my tennis shoes on and um, started my journey back to, uh, to the Sacramento County Airport and got off the plane to hear a message that they, um, they had selected me. Because of um, the wisdom that they, they said that I, that I possessed, I'm still trying to figure out where that wisdom came from because I... I'll tell you, it was the biggest, biggest uh, BS story I ever made up in my life, and it was right. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely right, so. This next, uh, this next uh, court, we're going to go to the state of Texas. The state of Texas is um, the, uh, oh my gosh, Tagua Indian Reservation in El Paso, Texas. The gentleman here, Lawrence Lujan, is my good, good friend. And Denise, I don't know if you know Lawrence or not. Lawrence is, um, Lawrence and I share a lot in common. A lot in common because one, um, Lawrence is a um, sergeant with the El Paso Police Department and a tribal member of his, of the um, reservation, I mean, tribal court that he sits for. Uh, Judge Lujan is um, also a, like I say, a tribal member. Like myself, prior to being a chief judge, I was also a police officer. I was also a probation officer. So he and I share a lot in common. His court administrator, Lorraine Galvin, is a awesome person. She also, um, she also is um, a, a supported by two court clerks, a prosecutor and a bailiff. Uh, majority of the type of cases that they hear, civil, adult, juvenile, family, and traffic. So when you ask about those, uh, those criminal cases, this court system actually hears their, their um, criminal type cases. Um, they, their cases that they hear, 230, their, their funding um, is uh, tribal government program grants, uh, and their estimated operating costs, $181,000. They used to, in the state of Texas, they used to have a casino, so what they did is when they had their casino, they, um, they built their, their infrastructure for their court system and they built a very nice court system that, um, that um, they still operate in. So they had their infrastructure. They didn't have to build it uh, afterwards. They already had it, and then they built their court system around the structure that they had built already. The interesting thing is um, in 2008, 
Judge Lujan and I came up with the idea that we both had juvenile drug courts and we were going to do a cultural exchange. The cultural exchange, um, we, I took six kids out of the uh, remote area of Humboldt County, California, and took them to El Paso, Texas. We paid for their airfare, we gave them meal money, we, the lodging, everything. We took them to El Paso, Texas. Judge Lujan and his court, I mean, um, sponsored the, um, the other portion of that, which is that they paid for our lodging once we got there, they took us into New Mexico and some other areas. Some of the things that my kids were most impressed with was the sign when you enter into their reservation. The notice, you are now entering a federal Indian reservation governed by the jurisdiction of the Isleta del Sol Pueblo Tribal Council. It is a sovereign nation with a trust relationship with the United States of America. So there it's saying to, what that is saying to you is, Welcome to Indian country. Welcome to Indian country. They, they, um, their court system is saying, once you cross that boundary, you are governed by their laws. And you're starting to see that pop up a little bit more and more and more in Indian country because like in, in, in Hoopa, people say, well, no, the state, the state of California says that that can't happen. I said, well, walk back outside the boundaries of the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation if you want to deal with the state of California's laws. But while well, you're here within the boundaries of the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation, you're going to abide by our laws. And that's one of the most unique signs that I think I've ever, that I have ever seen. Judge, uh, Judge Lujan is a, um, is a, a no-nonsense gentleman who, uh, I need to check on time here. Okay. 15? Okay. Uh, so Judge Lujan is, um, runs a pretty tight ship there also. Um, judge, the, but the, unique to the size of Texas to, um, to the rest of the United States, there are only three reservations in, in Texas. So to have one of, the, one of the tribal court systems in Texas is unique in itself. But to have it where it's located is even more unique is that the Isleta Cell uh, del Sur Pueblo Actually, the Isleta tribe was up in the Albuquerque area, and a portion of them broke off and went down into the, um, into the El Paso area. But even though that they're, they're related, their, their um, types of government are completely different. Even though same bloodlines, same, uh, you know, same families, their court systems are completely different from the state of New Mexico to the, um, to the state of Texas. El Paso. Well, Judge uh, Lujan told me not only does he have to deal with um, the issues in Texas, he's got New Mexico, but he's also got Mexico to deal with. So he's dealing with, you know, all these different variables, and then throw in there the city of El Paso and, you know, all that. I, um, you know, I have the utmost respect for Judge Lujan because, one, I thought I had it, I thought I had it rough dealing with just Oregon and California. He's got even a bigger, uh, a bigger mash of, uh, of people to, uh, to, uh, to deal with there. The Ho-Chunk Nation Tribal Court. I put this one in there because the Ho-Chunk, the last three are going to all be in Wisconsin. And the reason I picked these three Wisconsin tribes is because Wisconsin is where the Teague Protocol came from. It's one of the ideas, one of my... Uh, one of the visions that I had um, in the state of California is developing this relationship between the tribes in California with the tribes in the state, I mean, the state of California. The lady sitting up here on the top, Amanda Rockman, is, our, is a board member for the, uh, the NIGA organization. They have one of the most unique and um, extensive court systems that I think I have ever, have ever had the privilege of seeing. Judge Rockman, um, their, their court system is located in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. They have not only a, you know, their, their, their court systems, but they have Supreme Courts. So they, you know, their court system expands beyond itself, and they, they take care of, you know, from, from the beginning to the very end, the, the appellate processes. They got it all, they've got it all, they got it all covered. Their court system is, uh, over, is run by Chief Justice Mary Jo B. Uh, Hunter. And uh, again, Judge Rockman is pictured there to the right. Their tribal court 
has two judges and six support staff. Their court administrator, Martina uh, Gaither, but they also have a healing to wellness court that has one judge and 14 support staff. So you know the drug court system. Healing to wellness court is drug courts. Um, we, we, what we wanted to do is we wanted, a, a, we, we wanted it to be, we didn't like that name drug court in Indian country. So we wanted to, to go with a more traditional name. The more traditional name for us was uh, healing to wellness uh, courts because um, the, the philosophy is that we are not, the, it wasn't that it was going to be a drug court, that we were going to heal our, our youth, our people um, in, in a court system. The traditional court, um, the, um, when they say traditional court, they had six clans that were represented, the bear, warrior, eagle, buffalo, deer, and thunder uh, clans were all represented. Each of them have their own uh, separate court systems. The type of cases that they hear, civil, marriage, divorce, child in need of protective services, which is a new child in need of care that you heard in Alaska, and the ones that we call, um, that we called, um, we call them also child in need of care in, in Hoopa, juvenile court, elder domestic abuse, child support, employment, and enrollment. So, you know, that's just expanding. You know, we have all of those in, in my court in Hoopa, but with the exception of the, uh, adult, uh, the adult cases. Drug treatment court is, um, that's, a state, that's, a county, uh, that's a county run court system, but they work in collaboration with the state court. So the, the, uh, with Jackson County Circuit Court, so they have a, uh, a collaborative that they're working with to, to work and make certain that uh, both systems are, are providing, um, providing services to the, uh, to the membership. They hear a whopping 2,000 plus cases. Amanda estimated that it could be closer to 3,000. So th those, I mean, you're talking, that is, a, that is um, running right quote close to a, uh, a smaller um, um, county or state court system. The Oneida Tribal Court uh, located in, they, they made me put this, I would never have put that. Home of the, the they wanted to say world, world famous Green Bay Packers. But I, I kind of shortened that a little bit because I, she told me the only way that they were going to do it and give me information is if I put it up there. So there it is. I mean, you guys are my witnesses of there or ask if I did it, I did it. They were established in as early as 1991 and um, they're, um, they're in, uh, they have 11 judges. When they, they have five tribal court judges and six appellate court panels. But they have so many because they have three judge panels. They don't have one judge sitting and hearing a case individually. They, they have a three judge panel that, um, that represents the dispute resolution of the bear, wolf, and turtle clans. But um, the, the, I went to their court system and looked at them, uh, their court systems, because I wanted to see what a three panel judge system looked like. It's unique, it's nice because it's not one person. So if somebody's upset about an outcome in a hearing, it's heard by three individual people. It's not one person making a ruling. The types of cases that they are hearing, workman's comp, family law, child custody, child support, marriage and divorce, and housing and probate. The individuals up here, I, I wish I knew them all, but let me tell you, when, when the Oneida tribe was looking at developing their court system, what they decided to do was they went around the country and looked at different court systems, both tribal and state court systems. They went to, they, I think they actually went to New Zealand to look at their court system to see how they operated, to make sure that they were going to build a court system for their people that, um, that was not only going to work for them, but was going to work for the community that they worked with, the, the, um, the uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin area, the, to make sure that that court system um, that that was going to work for them. This this tribe is an enterprise. They are truly an enterprise. They have developed things for themselves that I mean. Not only are they a casino tribe, but they have they have also expanded into into the um, lodging world. They they have built hotels. They have you know gas station, restaurants, you know, they, they, they expanded themselves. But they're not only that, they, they have also expanded into other areas that this, that this um, tribal court oversees is that they also, uh, the buffalo pictures there, 
they raise buffalo and they sell that meat. I mean, and I, I was just amazed by, by that. But they also, um, one of the, the ladies, this lady right here, um, every year sends me a case of hot pickles. And if you have never had them, <laughs> have you had them? They are, um, they are awesome. But I'll tell you, every year I get a case of hot pickles from this lady. I mean, when you talk about, when you talk about working in Indian country, you meet these people, they're your friends for life. They're your friends for life. And um, they're, they're truly a, a wonderful bunch of people. They're, they're, they're funded by, entirely by their own selves. Yeah, they, they're all general, they're all from, from their general fund. They support their court system. Forest County Pottawatomie Tribal Court, located in Crandon, Wisconsin. Um, the gentleman here, Denise also knows, um, is uh, Chief Judge Eugene Whitefish. He's uh, re-swearing in his um, associate judge, Gerald Pernick. And there is no court administrator here because uh, Judge Whitefish, who is the chief judge, oversees that with his court clerk, um, oh, Latricia is her name. But, um, and he has three court staff, but I, one of the things I always, I always look at is their, their court facility. I was like, my gosh, they, they mirrored my court facility. Not really, but I mean, I'm, I'm jealous. It's, it's beautiful. But the types of cases that the, this tribal court hears, child support, paternity, custody, Indian child welfare, and general civil, they hear approximately uh, 400 new cases plus the review of older matters like my court system. Their estimated cost of operation is $450,000. But, uh, you know, one of the things I found out is that they're, um, this is another casino tribe, and they're very, very, very well paid, very well paid. So um, their, uh, their justice system, uh, the $450,000 that they pay for their justice system also is paid for out of their general fund also so that um, they operate their own, their own court system. And it, uh, Judge Whitefish um, is our past NIJA president. Judge Whitefish had some medical issues that he was unable to continue to um, fulfill that duty, so he graciously stepped down and allowed Judge Duran to, to take over the helm for two years. And then Judge Duran decided that he did not want to do it no longer, so uh, we now currently have a, a new um, president of NIJA. But um, Judge Whitefish, um, was uh, a, he is a um, wonderful, wonderful leader in the tribal, uh, in, in tribal politics and uh, as far as judicial, uh, as ju judicial issues are concerned. And we, uh, we as NIJA representatives, have gone to, the, uh, to Capitol Hill on several occasions to testify before Senate on issues of tribal courts. This last, this last slide, is um, what my mom calls the, um, this is the last place where the water leaves our valley. This is where they don't, we, we, in, in my culture, there is no word for goodbye. We don't have it. So um, the, the end, um, and it, the word for it is salish. The, the, that is the word for the last place and um, this is where this is where the last this is where the water leaves our reservation. So it was a good place for me to to end my presentation to you, and uh, again to thank you very much for your for your attention. And I, I hope that I did give you uh, a uh, a brief overview of the uh, tribal justice systems in Indian Country, and want to thank you very much for your attention. Sure. A majority of them are, um, I would say that at this point it's about 40-60. 40% are elected and 60% are appointed by tribal councils. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. This right, this here, 
That's a Cherokee. That's Cherokee ter ter territory. Big, huge. Yes. <laughs>